Good morning. It's Easter Sunday morning, and it's a great time to commemorate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you. We thank you for the death and the resurrection of our Lord. And Father, we just come to you this morning, and we just ask for your grace and mercy to be bestowed upon us. Touch your people in a special way is my prayer. And help us as we hear this sermon, O oh God. Help us to know you better. And Father, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to speak with you this morning on this subject, Breakfast with Jesus. In John chapter 21, after these things, after he rose from the dead, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise, he showed himself to them. What does it mean to show himself? He revealed himself to the disciples. He desires to reveal himself to us. Many times we don't recognize him in our lives, uh -huh. especially in the midst of trial, confusion, and circumstance. Uh -huh. We don't hear his voice sometimes because we're so easily distracted. We lead ourselves without his guidance. Uh -huh. <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 2, they were together Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. There were seven disciples out there on the water. Seven is the completion, the number of God for completion. Jesus wanted to do something special here this morning. He desired to bring something full circle, especially in the life of Simon Peter and the disciples. Jesus desires to clear up past business in our life that's so detrimental to our spiritual well-being. He wants to put the past behind us, praise God, so that we can look in the present and look toward the future with vision that he gives us. The Bible says, a matter of fact, as Paul spoke to the church in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Amen. We all know the life that Paul left, lived before he became a great disciple and preacher. He blasphemed God. He hurt Christians. He caused the murder of so many. But yet, what does he say here? Because God did a work in his life. God showed himself to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. And he caused those things, the shame and the guilt, to be swallowed up by the blood of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 21 and verse 3, Simon Peter said, I go a fishing. And they say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. The influence of one man, Peter, in a backslidden condition. He had already denied Christ three times. And here, he's leading these other men back to the water, back to the fishing business, back to where they were comfortable. I go a fishing means I have a tendency to return to my past. We have a tendency to return to what we think is pleasurable, especially to escape pain and discomfort in our lives. You know, there's too much conversation about the past and not what God is doing in our lives at the present moment. We perceive the past sometimes as security, our secure moments, pleasurable moments, we think, what we are familiar with. But there are only mechanisms that we hide behind. And God wants to swallow that up in our lives. He wants to clear up some unfinished business in our life. We fight change stubbornly, my friends. All of us do. 
We fight change stubbornly. I want to say that once again. And we look for the fool's comfort sometimes and fail to hear the voice of our Savior. Fail to see him showing up in our present moment, even in our despair. The Bible says, I go a fishing. What does that mean, I go a fishing? It means really a soldier, a, a sailor that's engaged on the salt water. It means salt. And it was a memory or a trigger for Peter especially. You see, Peter and Je uh, Jesus had history on the water. And they, the Bible says in Luke chapter 5 that Jesus asked them if he could use their boat one time. And so Peter is recollecting on that water some of the memories that he has about Jesus. Now this verse in this phrase means, and that night they caught nothing. What it means is they came up empty. And sometimes God wants to squeeze us. Sometimes God wants to seize us. Sometimes he wants to press into our life. And if you look at the definition of that phrase, it really means that God wants to crowd himself into our life and that God wants to seize our heart or arrest our heart, praise God, to bring us back to the place that he desires for us. The Bible says that they caught nothing and that's God's opportunity to seize us to apprehend or arrest our hearts and to capture our spirit once again. Our court nothing is our failure. Our self-centered plans, our carnality, our control of life, our thoughts and our ways, it's equal to I go a fishing. Peter heard Jesus in the past teaching about we are the salt of the earth. Fishing and being on the water was what Peter was longing for. He was longing for yesterday. Memories had to touch his heart while he was in that boat. Before things got muddled, before things got complicated, before his denial of Christ three times at the fire as he warmed his hands during the trial of Jesus. Listen, my friend. Peter was probably saying some of these things. I just want to be with Jesus. I want things to return the way they were. I long for relationship. Lord, how did I get at this point? How did I come here? Why so many issues and concerns? How did my life get messed up? What happened to my faith, Lord? My walk with you, Lord, for three years. Help me remember the joy of the Lord. Peter was saying, help me, Lord, deal with my shame and my guilt and my isolation. I go a fishing. Sounds so habitual and methodical. The real cry is, let me be the salt of the earth again. The real cry is, Lord, let me walk with you. The real cry, Lord, let me touch you one more time. Let me touch the hem of your garment. Let me hear your voice. Lord, speak words to my soul this morning. Peter let Jesus down. But listen, my friend, Jesus did not forsake Peter. And he will not forsake you. Amen. You see, when Jesus saw Peter for the first time in the book of John chapter 1 and verses 40 to 43, which I'm not going to read, Jesus named Peter Cephas. Jesus knew what Peter would become eventually through him. Jesus knew that Peter had a future. Jesus was on a mission after the resurrection to ensure Peter's future. My friend, that's exactly what he wants to do for us. Through the resurrection, he wants to ensure our future. We have a future, according to Jeremiah 29 and 11. And it's a good future. It's one of success. It's good thoughts. Hallelujah. It's a good ending that we have with Jesus. Because he rose from the dead. He rose. Hallelujah. He came off that cross, went in that tomb. And on the third day, he rose again. Hallelujah. To ensure our future in this present moment and in this life to come. Can you say amen? amen? Jesus knew that one day Peter would stand up in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. But Peter standing with the 11. Listen, influence of one man's leadership. 
He lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. This is Peter. This is Jesus saying, Peter, praise God down the road in a few days because he was going to ensure Peter's future and he was going to restore him. Because Peter would say on that day, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters, praise God, shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Jesus saw the power of God upon Peter a few days later. He knew that Peter would preach on the day of Pentecost. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's follow this story. In John chapter 21 and verse 4, but when morning was now come, listen carefully, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Oh, my friend, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. After catching nothing, after we toil all night, Jesus stands in the precipice of our life. <laughs> Come, on. Come on. Our darkness, our depression, our discouragement, and his holy glory shines upon us like the noonday sun. A new dream he desires to give us. A new vision, praise the Lord. A new hope arises in our heart. Amen. And many times we don't even see him or hear his voice speaking to us. Because we stay muddled. And we stay on the lake fishing and toiling and catching nothing. The Bible said in verse 5, Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? And they answered him, No. They still didn't know who he was. Why does Jesus call them children? He asked them a question. And he asked us the same question this morning. Do you have any meat? Do you have any substance to give me? What's he asking? He's asking this. Do you have any worship or praise for me? Do you have any worship or praise for me? Can you lift your voice? Can you open your heart to me? Do you have any meat, children? And I looked at this word, children, and it means a young child immature. It means a boy that has been punished. It means someone that is a slave or servant to that punishment. It means, in a, in a word, having unresolved conflict. You see, our failure or the failure of someone in our life causes us pain causes us turmoil. We've all gone to the principal's office one time in our life, and we felt real bad about being reprimanded. We felt real bad about having to do detention. And it brought shame and guilt upon us. It spoke to our hearts and made us feel bad. Jesus, when he called them children, he was saying to them, I know you feel bad, Peter. I know, disciples, you feel bad. I know you feel like you have been punished. But hold on and let me speak to you and let me reveal myself to you. This is what Jesus is saying. And he said in the very next verse, he said, Cast thy net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. And they cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. My friend, this is a trigger for Peter. This is a memory for Peter. What are you saying, Pastor? Let's go back into the Bible in Luke chapter 5 and verse 4. The first time when Jesus came upon their boats, he asked them, may I use your boat for a platform? 
May I speak to the people for a few minutes? Now these disciples had toiled all night, my friend. They were tired, they smelled, they didn't catch anything. They couldn't sell any fish to pay their bills. They were discouraged. They were men with broken hearts and they were tired. Let me help you recollect that scene. In Luke 5, 4, it says, When he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a drought. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Jesus is using the same words in John chapter 21, so Peter can get a memory of what's going on here. So Peter can understand what is triggering this memory. Who, who said this to me before? In John chapter 21, verse 6, cast thy net on the right side of the ship. I, I have a memory, Peter was saying. I remember someone speaking to me in Luke chapter 5. I, I remember it was Jesus. Why is this happening? Am I dreaming this? Am I, have I been in this boat too long on the lake? <laughs> Listen, the right side of the boat means to me the right hand of God. It means to receive. You see, my friend, when we shake hands, we shake hands with the right hand of fellowship. It says, I receive you. You're my friend and we have a friendship. I love the verse in Psalm 16 and 8. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Amen. The Bible says in Psalm 16 and 11, that will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. He's at our right hand, my friend. He is right here, praise God. And Peter is getting these memories and he's saying to himself, what's going on here on this lake this morning? Verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, and that was John, saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. It is the Lord. Amen. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. It was John that recognized Jesus. It was John that recognized the voice. Amen. Sensitivity and perception and recognition is what we need in our lives to recognize the voice of Christ. Let me say that again. We need spiritual sensitivity, spiritual perception, and spiritual recognition to hear the voice of our Lord. Not as cluttered words. We're so cluttered. We're so distracted. We, we have to watch out for those distractions that take our desire away from God when God wants to speak to us. We need that sensitivity. We need that perception. And we need the recognition of God when he speaks to our heart. It's so important. John recognized it's the Lord, Peter. Wait a minute. In verse 8, and the other disciples came in a, in a little ship for for they were not far from land, but they were about 200 cubits away, and they were dragging the net with the fishes. <laughs> what's happening here? I'll tell you what's happening, my friend. We're so worried in this life about what we don't have or about what we need. But here's what Jesus was saying to those disciples on the lake. I can supply your need. Amen. You don't have to go back to the fishing business, Peter. And John and disciples, I called you for something else. This miracle confirmed Jesus as the Messiah. 
God was renewing their call to preach, praise God, like he did in Luke chapter 5 when they were originally summoned by Jesus. Hallelujah. When he spoke from that boat, what he was saying was, I want more than your boat, disciples. I want your life. I want to use your life as a platform, as a presentation to this world that I am in your soul, I'm in your spirit, I'm in your body. I want you to preach this gospel as ambassadors for Christ to the world. And that's what he calls us to do. You might not be called to be a preacher, but you've been called to be a, an ambassador. You've been called to be a presentation. Hallelujah. You've been called by God to show the love of Jesus, especially to the unlovely. Amen. What happened? In verse 9, as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid there on and bread. Another reenactment, another trigger, another memory for Peter. What are you saying, Pastor? <laughs> the fire of coals for Peter was his place of failure. Remember the trial? Remember him warming his hands? Remember the young maiden saying, weren't you his friend? And three times Peter said, I don't even know him. <laughs> Listen to me, my friend. Jesus desires to bring us full circle to the foot of the mountain where things need to be addressed once again. I want to say that again to you. Jesus desires to bring us full circle to the foot of the mountain where things need to be addressed once again. Where you left off you can't escape this setup. Amen. Only God can recreate this. Only God can do this. Only God's timing and providence can cause Peter to have a reenactment of his life so God can swallow up his shame, his guilt, and his isolation. What you do with this setup will determine your spiritual growth and your future. Amen. Many people ignore it. Many people ignore the signs, but Jesus desires to send us back to the same lake where we failed for a purpose to help us regain our spiritual balance and perspective. You have to understand this teaching. He desires to bring us back to the place of failure where we caught nothing. He desires to swallow up our carnality. He desires to swallow up the times that we just go about life without asking him about it. What are you saying, Pastor? Luke chapter 22 and verse 54. And they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. Many people are following Jesus afar off. They're standing away from the lake. They don't want to put their foot in totally. For Jesus. And when they had kindled a fire, there's that fire. The coals of fire are on the seashore. Jesus is saying, Listen, I've got this. I'm in control of your lives, I'm in control of this world. And they kindled a fire in the midst of the hole and, and were set down together. Peter sat down among them. He's going to listen in on the trial. But a certain maid, beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, this man also was with him. And he denied him saying, woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed saying, of a truth, this fellow was also with him for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately when he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. What happened? Jesus is now reenacting that scene where that fire was kindled. Praise God during the trial of Jesus where Peter sat by and denied Christ three times. 
Jesus is not going to let Peter suffer any longer. Come and dine. That's the clarion call in verse 10 of John 21. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, 153. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples dost ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. You see, their eyes were open at this point. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. My friend, what a scene of food and fellowship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus desires our fellowship, praise the Lord. He desires his presence in our life, not a methodical or habitual religion. We have to get rid of that methodical, habitual religion. We must gain the salvation of the Lord. Now where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We must have freedom to worship our God, to raise our hands, to worship God. This is our meat, to praise our God, the living Savior. Jesus is saying, I don't want you just to come to church. I want church to be in you. Jesus desires a romance, a spiritual dance, if you please, a friendship, a marriage, an intimacy, not some dead and dry religion, not an enduring friendship, but something alive and in the present moment, hearing his voice and talking to him like he's really there, my friend. Come, <laughs> Come and dine. Jesus is saying, children, have breakfast with me on the seashore. I have the coals of fire and the fish and the bread. And they sat down and they had a meal. And the Bible says in John chapter 21 and verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. In verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. In verse 17, John 21, he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Hmm. What was Jesus doing? Publicly, Peter denied Christ three times. That third time, that he asked Peter if he loved him. He grieved Peter because another trigger, another memory of that trial, his hands being warmed by the fire. But Jesus did it on purpose. He has a method to his madness, quote unquote. He has a method to bring us back, praise God, and to get us away from the foot of the mountain that keeps us stalled, that keeps us at bay that keeps us a slave and a servant, that keeps us like a child that went to the principal's office, that feels he was punished and now I feel bad. Now I have to go see my mom and dad and tell them what I did. Jesus is saying, Peter, it's enough. It's enough. Listen to the thinking here. Jesus generated uneasiness in Peter on purpose. And you know, sometimes he does the same thing to us to get us to move off of our spiritual condition, so to speak, to get us moved to the place where he desires. This was to be a therapeutic moment in Peter's life. Did it hurt? Absolutely. 
Did it bring back a bad memory? Absolutely. Did it bring back him denying Christ three times? Absolutely. And now, is he a bit embarrassed in front of his cohorts, the ones that follow him to go fishing? Because Peter's a leader. He's a born leader. He had the quality of leadership. And now in front of all the six disciples, he's being questioned. Do you love me, Peter? Hmm. Peter was going to react to Jesus. Lord, do you know something that I don't know? Of course he does. You're questioning me in this manner on purpose because Peter is not a fool. He's a smart man. He walked with Jesus for three and a half years. And he was saying, will I fall again? Is that why you're bringing all this up, Lord? Will I fail? Jesus helped Peter get off the hook, so to speak. Peter was in pain. Peter was in misery. He didn't know where he stood. Notice, my friend, that Jesus called Peter by his original name. And not the new name that he was given back, praise God, in the New Testament early. The name was Cephas. Because at that time, Peter, this time right now, was not a rock. Cephas meant a rock. Peter was not a rock at this moment. He was a weak, frail man that had failed the Lord, that was feeling bad about himself. The same way he felt bad when he toiled all night and caught no fish. And now he's being questioned by Jesus in front of his disciples. Imagine that happening today in our churches. <laughs> oh my, the churches would empty. Now let me just give you a little Bible study on what Jesus was doing here. The first two times that Jesus asks Peter, lovest thou me? The word lovest means agape love. And Peter's response is this. Thou knowest that I love thee. The word lovest, when Peter said the word lovest, meant filio, or friend. Follow the thinking. That happened two times. Jesus was asking Peter, do you have agape love for me? And Peter's response was, of course I have agape love for you. But I also have filio and friendship love for you. Listen carefully. The third time, Jesus asked Peter, lovest thou me? And the word love us this time from the mouth of Jesus meant filio or friend. It did not mean agape, as it did in the first two times when Jesus asked Peter if he loved him. Now the third time when Jesus said, do you love me? Jesus was saying the word love, it means friend or filio. The interaction here was this. Jesus asking the first two times, do you have God's love for me? And Peter's reply was, I have God's love for you, but I also have friendship love for you. I want to be your friend again, Jesus. Follow. The third interaction, Jesus was saying to Peter, I accept your agape love for me, but I also accept, praise God, your friendship love for me. And in return, he was saying, I give you my friendship in return, not only as God, but as a friend. Do you know the relief that came into Peter's spirit at that moment had to be insurmountable. Do you know when Jesus was extending actually the right hand of fellowship to him in the spirit by saying, I want to be your friend again, Peter. I want you to walk with me. I want to talk with you. I want to break bread with you every day that you're alive. Praise God. I want to have camaraderie again. I want you to be in my life, and I want to be in your life. Praise the Lord. What's God saying to us this morning? Here's what God was saying to Peter. We're good now. It's settled. Amen. Listen, this is important. Because you know a lot of people can't let things go. A lot of people just can't let it get settled. A lot of people just have to hold on to stuff. They hold on to their past. They hold on to their grudges. They hold on to their bitterness. And it's not settled in your life. And it shows up every so often. Amen. It's like a volcano that's about to erupt. And it just takes a small thing for that eruption to take place like a volcano. Here's what he's saying. We have put the past to rest. Closure. 
a new day has been birthed. Lambs and sheep are most precious and valuable to Jesus. His people are dear to his heart. He called them his beloved. He called us this morning his beloved. He longs for relationship and friendship, praise God. That's symbolic of marriage. He desires romance to dance with us, if you please, to help you become like him so the world can understand the love of Jesus. Let me talk for just a moment about we're good. You know, for a long time we lived our lives and it wasn't good. For a long time, because we were born in sin, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Life wasn't good. But you know, when we came to the realization as the Holy Spirit pricked our hearts, convicted us of our sin, and we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Jesus was saying this to us, I love you. And we're good now. Amen. We're friends. You say, Pastor, how, how could that be? I want to tell you how it can be. Because in John chapter 15 and verse 15, it says these words. It says, Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. Amen. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Do you know what best friends do? They confide in each other. You know what best friends do? They guard each other's heart. That's what best friends do. Listen to me for a moment. If I've seen one thing plague Christians, that I've been in the ministry for over 45 years, 47 years, one thing that I've seen plague people terribly is their guilt and their shame that they have from their past. I have met many, many people in my lifetime. I have preached to tens of thousands of people in my lifetime. But this one thing that always creeps into their conversation, and they say these words, I know God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. You know what they're saying? They're saying the same thing that Peter said. I still deal with shame and guilt. I still think about the fire, the coals of fire, and, and Puncher, Puncher's Pilate's trial for Jesus and when I was warming my hands. I feel bad that I've toiled. I feel bad that my life has come to this. I feel bad. But here's what Jesus is saying. You've come to the cross. You have salvation. And Jesus is saying, listen, I want to be your friend. And we're good now. This is settled. I want to swallow up your past. Putting those things behind. Forgetting those things which are behind. If God can forgive, forgive Saul of Tarsus, hallelujah. And bring him to his knees on the Damascus road, hallelujah. If he can make him into a great preacher and become Paul the Apostle, hallelujah. And can swallow Follow up his guilt and his shame. That's why Paul said, there's therefore now no more condemnation. Praise God, because I'm in Christ Jesus. He wants to swallow up your shame. He wants to swallow up your guilt. He wants to swallow up your pain. He wants to swallow up your failure in the name of Jesus. He wants to take it. And he wants to hold you. He wants to bring you to his bosom. He calls you his beloved. And he wants to speak these words to you. We're good. It's settled. The past is over. Look in the present moment and look to your future as I will direct you by my Holy Spirit. A last verse to leave you with, which is so profound to this sermon. Proverbs 18, 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. Do you know what Jesus did on that seashore that day? As he showed himself to his disciples, he says, a man that has friends shows himself friendly. He showed up as a friend, as a savior, as their king of kings and lord of lords. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And that friend this morning, my friend, is Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And you can depend on him for the rest of your days. And through
throughout eternity. Because that's why he came, born of a virgin. He died on the cross and rose again on the third day that he might settle the sin issue in our life and speak to us and say, we're friends. Let us pray. Father, you've given us another opportunity to speak for you. I give you glory, honor, and praise. And I thank you, Lord, for the form that you have afforded us during this time to send this gospel out to many people. And I pray for them this morning. I pray, God, that you would heal bodies in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would touch the spirit and the soul of men and women and boys and girls. I pray, God, that you would swallow up their pain, that you would swallow up, oh God, their guilt and their shame and their isolation. That, God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would speak to them as the Savior, as the King of kings, and as the Lord of lords, and speak these words to him, to them. We're good. It's settled. We're friends. And I'll stick closer to you than a brother can stick close to you. God, touch your people. Bless us this glorious day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.